so good morning. We're going to start now at the first part of our course, which uh, is going to put everybody on the same page and it's called Quantum Mechanics from the Ground Up or Formal Quantum Mechanics. In this part, I'm going to go much faster than in the remainder of the module because here I'm going to pretty much state what you're already supposed to know, but in a more formal way. So we're going to start and is it? Yeah. Okay, sharing. And so let's start then. And what we're going to see here is what we want to achieve. So let's ensure our aims are clearly stated. What I would like to do now is to provide a revision, which is going to go ultra, ultra, ultra fast of the methods that we use in quantum mechanics. But this is going to be done at a more general informal level than what has been discussed so far. So don't worry if you think you're going to be bored because you won't, hopefully. And we're going to also take some time, and this is going to be more detailed than what I'm going to do this week, to deepen the mathematical tools that you use in quantum mechanics. And we're going to see how this is connected to linear algebra. And if you would like to complement what we are teaching right now in this video, you can have a look at chapter two of Cohen Tanuji, apart from our notes. And in my opinion, how they wrote this, this is the best uh, presentation ever of uh, these uh, formal tools. So if you have the chance, do have a look. So let's start with the postulates of quantum mechanics that everybody knows, hopefully. And the key idea behind this postulate was to put some kind of consistency and to provide a physical picture of uh, the experiments and of things which were being observed. And this was quite tough for people uh, in the late 19th or beginning of the 20th century because uh, quantum mechanically, actually, if you think about quantum mechanics, ontologically, this is pretty different from everything that had been done before in terms of physics because philosophically, you have like a radical, radical, radical breach with everything people knew. And the implications are enormous uh, in the sense that even nowadays, if you want to look and if you make some kind of pull and ask, okay, what is your interpretation of the things that you see in quantum mechanics, uh, you pretty much are going to conclude that there is no consensus and new interpretations appear all the time. So if you're curious, have a look at this Wikipedia entry. It's actually uh, quite nice if, if you just want to have a brief overview uh, on the different interpretations of quantum mechanics. So people were finding things experimentally in the early 20th century. This was tough. Uh, what was available could not be used to explain that. And when you observe things and you realize you're gonna need new paradigms, you start to postulate and try to make a consistent story of what you're observing. So the first postulate is that every isolated physical system has associated with it a complex inner product space or Hilbert space. This is known as its state space. And a complete description of the system is given by a state vector psi, a unit normalized vector in the space, state space. 
So we see here we have already quite a few concepts from linear algebra, namely inner product, right? State vector, state space, unitarity, and normalization. Just look at this postulate and see how we state it, and you're going to see pretty much all of this. And the idea was not only to say that you could describe this system using a state vector, but to generalize the notions that you find in linear algebra to this kind of situation, which is uh, by Dirac, among others, but he was absolutely brilliant. So the second postulate is related to how the system evolves because we need to cook up something and we need to say how the system is going to evolve, what is going to happen. So the evolution of an isolated system is described by, sorry, I forgot by, the time dependent Schrodinger equation where H is the Hamiltonian operator, which is a Hermitian operator, which specifies the full dynamics of the system. So, you have here quite a few concepts too. For instance, you see we're talking now about evolution, we're talking about Hamiltonian, we're talking about operators, and we're talking about hermeticity. So uh, if you look at it and you see, okay, you have some entity which is associated to a physical system that's isolated, and you can describe the time evolution, of the system by using this mysterious vector and also the Schrodinger equation, we need to have a look and we need to think what does this mean mathematically and also uh, from the point of view of the physical interpretation. For the curious, there are also no Hamiltonian Hamiltonians in quantum physics. You are old enough to know that, so I'm telling you now, you are on your fourth uh, quantum mechanics year. So uh, you always hear that the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian for the eigenvalues to be real. This is wrong. Or better said, incomplete. Because if the Hamiltonian is real, or if your Hamiltonian is Hermitian, you know the eigenvalues if, are real. But if you try to go the other way around, uh, if you have real eigenvalues, it could be Hermitian or non-Hermitian, or better stated, pseudo-Hermitian. So, for the curious, have a look at that. And uh, I promise it's quite interesting. In fact, let me give you just a brief idea. You can have non-Hermitian Newtonians when you have uh, complex eigenenergies. This means you have a system which is connected to a bath or an environment and you introduce decay. So uh, this means that uh, you're going to have some kind of width in your energy when you're trying to describe this uh, eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation. And these guys found that sometimes a Hamiltonian is no Hermitian, but has real eigenvalues, because what they did is they got a Hamiltonian, which was a harmonic oscillator with some kind of cubic non-Hermitian extension, definitely non-Hermitian. They diagonalized it, and they found these beautiful things here, which you can see on the screen, which means that uh, the arrow, mathematically speaking, just goes one way, as I said. If a Hamiltonian is Hermitian, all the eigenvalues are real, but if the eigenvalues are real, you don't know. Huh? Now, we can say, yes, Hermeticity is a sufficient but not necessary condition. And if you are even more curious about it, Wigner had already spotted something like that, but he dismissed this as a curiosity. Just said, ah, rubbish, I don't care. Or probably something like that, I don't know. And I'm advertising also a conference that takes place, in fact, here from home, uh, which is on Hermitian uh, 
Hamiltonian systems are curious, have a look at the link below. And uh, is attended by a lot of people from many, many countries, and it takes place every Thursday afternoon. So don't try to book any office hours with me on Thursday afternoon. But if you're curious, do watch the um, virtual conference. And last but not least, we need to talk about measurement. Because we have discussed a physical system that is evolving, that is represented by a vector in state space. But let's suppose we want to measure a quantity. What is going to happen? And actually, this was one of the biggest uh, shocks introduced by quantum mechanics is that the measurement you make and depending on the question you ask changes the system. And we needed to find a way to postulate this and to put this in a consistent framework. So we're going to bring the third postulate, which is associated with measurement. And this postulate says that associated with every observable quantity is a Hermitian operator M with a spectral decomposition M sum over J lambda J P J, where lambda J are eigenvalues of uh, the Hamiltonian or whatever operator you have and PJ are projectors and the eigenvalues label the possible outcomes of the measurement. So depending on what measurement you have, you have uh, a certain eigenvalue of that operator. And when the measurement is performed on a system in a state psi, the probability that the eigenvalue j is returned is psi pj psi, where pj is the projector. Immediately after the measurement, immediately why? Because don't forget there is time evolution. So if you let some time uh, pass to ask this question, this seems going to evolve. So it has to be immediately after the measurement. The state of the system is going to become psi dash equals pj psi divided by the square root of the probability that the eigenvalue j is returned. So this is a normalized projection of psi onto the eigen subspace associated with lambda j. So here you see that we are again bringing some concepts from linear algebra and trying to generalize them uh, to a quantum mechanics framework. For instance, we talk about projectors, we talk about eigenvectors, we talk about eigenvalues of that M operator, we talk about spectral decomposition, and we talk about eigen subspaces. So uh, these are clearly concepts that were used and that existed in linear algebra, and they were applied to quantum mechanics to devise a framework for this theory. Note as well that in some textbooks we talk about six postulates instead of three. You may be asking yourself, but why do you talk only about three? I heard six. Yes, this is true. And you can, for instance, read this in more detail in uh, Quantum Mechanics by Coentanuji, Tilbe, and Laloe. However, if you look more closely, you see that postulate three here contains several ideas. First, it contains the idea that observables can be described as operators, right? That to a physical quantity you associate an operator. Second, it is stating the principle of spectral decomposition because the probability associated with obtaining an eigenvalue lambda j is uh, psi pj psi, so you're projecting onto that eigen subspace that is associated with that specific eigenvalue. Also, when you say that the only possible outcome of a measurement of a specific physical quantity is one of the eigenvalues of the corresponding operator, this is also an idea which is pretty much related 
to the fact that the system is going to exist in a quantum superposition, maybe. And when you perform the measurement, the whole thing is going to collapse. So this is going to uh, manifest itself in the eigenvalue. And also, the state of the system is going to change. So you're going to have an eigenvector, or if you have a degenerate say, state, let's say a combination thereof associated or eigenvectors, if it's degenerate eigenvector, if it's non-degenerate associated to that eigenvalue lambda j. So we're projecting onto the eigen subspace associated with that. So thank you for that. We're, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a break here and I'll start a new video still related to uh, this specific chapter. And we're going to discuss uh, other issues, for instance, um, mathematical tools that we use uh, in conjunction with these uh, postulates.